I want to shift gears to, to therapy now and, and, and thinking about, um, you know, our earlier use of chemotherapy, novel androgen receptor targeted therapy in the metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer setting and thinking about how those agents now have really changed the landscape of not just castrate sensitive disease, but the biology that emerges in castrate resistant disease. And, and Alani, I was wondering if you could just kind of walk us through some of the data uh, regarding the rationale for, for chemotherapy uh, and maybe the, some of the updated data from Charted, um, some of the, the rationale for, for uh, abiraterone from Stampede and Latitude, and then some of the newer studies that have been coming out uh, around um, enzalutamide and, and apalutamide and, and whatnot. Where, where are we today with, uh, with, with the management of metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer. Thank you, Dan. And I, I just before going to that, I just wanted to add a little comment on the previous, Tanya, great comment, where actually a lot of us are trying to do studies along these lines. But Ben, I liked your attitude about knowledge offering the way forward. There are a lot of naysayers saying still we won't be able to use it. The bottom line, though, is that none of us really has had this extensive experience that we're seeing in the rest of the world. And we need to look more towards Europe and Germany where they all started to understand better how they're actually using it. One thing that Chuck, probably you might come back to later on when we speak about the Hoffman data is, I saw that with, with the PSMA PET, we get a lot of specificity. We're going up to 95%, but we're still not there with sensitivity. It looks, and it may be, and that's what I'm gonna use as a segue to get to the hormone naive castration sensitive, let's call it space, with regard to heterogeneity, because it could be that PSMA being a more molecular based imaging assay is not picking up the disease to the extent that we want because of that heterogeneity. So with that in mind, and again, just that parenthesis closes, I, I think we're very privileged compared to even five years ago to have this option right now in the clinic for what is metastatic castration sensitive disease. But what is in a disconnect is even though we've had this data starting from 2014-15 with charted, then stampede, repeatedly stampede, latitude, um, a titan, uh, and uh, waiting on other data sets to come forward, aerosense and the like, the problem that we're having is that there's a disconnect with real world practice. If you look even in this country where right now one of these agents, abiraterone, has become generic, the numbers maybe a little skewed, but they don't look like we're even reaching 50% of capacity of treating these men with castration naive with any of these agents. The numbers for chemotherapy is, are actually quite low, less than 10%, and Ben might want to comment on that. So we have strong data to support that either the use of cytotoxic chemotherapy in the name of docetaxel or any of three FDA-approved agents, abiraterone, uh, enzalutamide, apalutamide has an impact in all primary endpoints, RPFS, overall survival, and um, all secondary endpoints, of course. Why are we not using them yet? That, that, is it part of the learning curve? Is it part of the difficulties of access in the clinic? Or are there still those who believe that later may be equivalent to earlier? And that's my main point. All of these trials, and especially when you look at 11 positive phase three trials with enhanced androgen signal inhibition, are pointing to the fact that it's, it's one of the, the main drivers and it, it, it should be probably your first choice with exceptions that we can comment on, but also that earlier is better. And we're gonna to get to this data. So this is my main concern. We're all embracing the fact that we can treat hormone naive disease regardless of risk or volume, we should take into consideration the comorbidities that may be impacting the quality of life of these patients. And we are now understanding better how to cater to bone health. And a lot of you are doing a lot of research along the lines of generalized health index. So where are we standing with actual real world practice would be my main concern. You know, if I can comment, Dan, one of the questions and I think Eleni touched on this also is, a little bit what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, attach a binary tool to a continuous variable. 
and that metastatic disease is probably a continuum, of course. And when, when Eleni mentioned the sensitivity of the gallium 68 PSMA PET, maybe not being as high as we, we would like, it's because it's higher, the higher the PSA gets where we don't really need it. Um, and where we, where we really want to have it is when it's, it begins to lose a little bit of its sensitivity. But the idea is that the idea that we go from having no metastases to some metastases, you know, uh, like we've jumped over some border uh, is not really the case. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's that they're always there. It's just a, a matter of the volume. It's, it's a great point. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we, you know, our coding makes everything black and white, but, but the reality is, is that we, we see this disease as a continuum. 